Uh, my name is Dr. Miranda Melcher. Um, as advertised, I was at King's College London, where I started this research and teaching practice. Um, but I am actually moved to City University of London, um, and so we'll be representing that institution today. Can you now see my slides? Not yet, no. Okay, that's fine. As we all know, technology is sometimes interesting. <laughs> um, so I will continue because I know we are pressed for time. Um, so uh, I am in an interesting position of having started my teaching career as a student myself. Um, in fact, my uh, academic background is not in education. I just love to teach. I come from a social science background um, in war, where we teach lots of very controversial topics to an incredibly diverse range of students. So this is diverse in terms of gender, nationality, but also in terms of age and background. As you can probably imagine, um, in the study of war, we have a lot of veterans, we have a lot of mature students, and we even have active military students as well. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting population of students to both be part of and to teach. Um, additionally, with my move from Kings to City, I've gone from being a full-time academic uh, that dabbled as an education technologist to now moving over to being a full-time education technologist that remains tied to academia. So I have a lot of different hats to talk about today. Um, and the goal of what I'm going to be talking about is how can we use some of the resources that we um, already have access to um, to make sure that we make all of our teaching as inclusive as possible. Now, uh, I don't know, can we now see slides? No? Yes, we can, yes. Amazing. Um, cool. So we're talking about inclusivity um, specifically from the lens of disability and neurodiversity, as that's where a lot of my research and teaching practice has focused. Um, and what my general uh, point is, is actually very similar to one of the presentations we heard earlier from Nina and Daniela, which is that explaining to students what we're doing, why, and trying to be as clear as possible is actually one of the biggest benefits we can have in our teaching. Um, and that's across subject areas. That's across types of students. And so although we often think about accessibility from a perspective, as I believe, um, Phil, you mentioned, from students with specific disabilities or learning needs, in fact, the benefits of being inclusive and accessible in our teaching can help a much, much larger population of students. So whether or not you know you have students with disabilities or learning differences in your classes, um, the idea of inclusivity is that all of our students can benefit from these kinds of practices. Um, and the particular focus of my uh, teaching and research practice, some of which I'll be sharing with you today, is what can we do as teachers that is low effort and high impact for our students? So again, following up on the themes already mentioned, in my experience, it's not so much about what's the flashiest new thing we can do as what can we do a little bit every single day um, that makes the learning experience more inclusive and accessible for all of our students. And so we do this through three principles. The first is to be specific. Um, often in our minds as teachers, we have all sorts of information about exactly what we're going to teach and how we're going to do this and what we want students to do. Um, but we often don't necessarily explain all of those expectations to our students, especially if we're so used to teaching and practice and we've done it a million times. We know what these things mean, but those aren't always communicated to students. And being specific can actually be quite simple. It can be just an extra sentence of explanation. Um, but for example, if you're going to say things like posting on forums, to use an example that I've seen make massive change just in the teaching that I've had influence on in the last year, um, saying things like, Forums are an integral part of your learning experience. Please make sure to post once a week before your discussion seminar. Great. Once a week. What does that actually mean? Does that mean right before the seminar? Does that mean the day before? Does that mean after doing the reading? What are you actually meant to be posting? Is it discussion questions to then use in the seminar? Is it analysis of one reading? Is it a place to ask all of your questions? simply saying post in the forum doesn't actually clarify specifically what you're asking for. Now, the good thing is you probably know exactly what you're asking for. So all you have to do is explain that to the students. Um, in fact, trying this out on a course that we taught in 2019 before the pandemic, 
when forums were kind of a nice to have, but we had other ways of getting feedback from students to doing it during the pandemic when it was fully online. Um, just adding these extra few sentences of explanation went from near constant 100% participation from every student in the forum, um, whereas before we might be lucky to get two thirds on a particular week. So that's the first principle is being specific. Second is being transparent. And this builds really nicely on what Nina and Daniela were talking about earlier, um, which is the idea of explaining why we're doing things. And this isn't just about why a student should care about learning something. This is also about explaining the norms and expectations that were embedded in academia that we might be so familiar with, we've forgotten to explain. So this can happen in a bunch of different ways. Um, for example, I find simply reminding my students using Oliver's example of Discord. Hey, I know you guys are really used to using Discord and really like it. Remember, I'm still learning it. So please let me know how I can improve. Simply explaining that I don't know everything or where I'm coming from can be really helpful. Similarly, marking criteria. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only academic who has had to sit through hours of training on exactly how to interpret the marking criteria so that all of our grades are standard across the department. We've been in academia for a while. We know how to mark things and we still go through training. How much less clear is that marking criteria to our students who don't have that kind of background? So a really great example for inclusivity is explaining that, for example, in my former department, um, we focused on sources, understanding and structure. Those are the three main areas that we really wanted students to show their abilities on. We didn't care particularly about typos or grammatical inaccuracy. However, we had a large number of students. In fact, the majority of our students did not have English as their first language and maybe were uncomfortable with that. As soon as we explained to students that there actually wasn't a section of the marking criteria that cared about typos, that as long as we could understand what they were saying, that was fine. Willingness to show drafts, willingness to come to office hours and ask about drafts and willingness to put things in the chat on a quick basis without having a lot of time to edit and perfect immediately went up. Um, and in fact, students started to come to office hours explicitly saying, because I know, because I don't have to be worried about typos, I'm willing to let you look at this draft. Um, and so just explaining what did and did not count made a huge difference. And again, this comes from a place of thinking about disability and neurodiversity, but had immediate impacts for a much broader student population. And finally, being mindful. Um, we've gotten really good at this over the last year in a lot of ways, but it's a constantly evolving journey. So a year ago, it maybe wouldn't be top of mind to think about different time zones, for example, for people tuning into live sessions. We're good at that now. If I had a cat that decided to walk across my keyboard, we'd all probably be fine with it. But continuing to think about things like mindfulness, as Phil mentioned at the beginning, captions may not mean a lot to some of us, but to others, it can be the absolute difference between being able to follow versus not. So just continuing to think about all the different pieces of your teaching. How can I make that clearer? How can I make that more understandable? What's the background and context that they that I have that they may not? Um, is just a constantly evolving thing to think about how can our teaching make the most sense to our students? So let's talk about this in terms of the chat. Um, so some quick examples of things that I like to do in this area. Icebreakers. At the beginning and end of every live session, I will ask a silly question. What ice cream flavor sums up your mood today, etc. Um, and I will ask something like that at the end of every session. I will ask every single student to pop an answer in the chat without really thinking about it. Benefits. It's a great way for students to participate. If they've done it once, even on something really simple and easy, they're much more likely to continue throughout the rest of the session. Um, it immediately highlights technical issues. If someone can't post in the chat, they can log out and come back in before we've actually gotten to the content. It also doubles as attendance taking, which is very convenient. Tips for doing this. Um, explain how much length, clarity and English you're actually requiring. So please put in the chat the current flavor of ice cream that sums up your mood right now. It can just be one word. Uh, don't worry about thinking too hard. Just go with your gut. Gives a set time to respond. So say, I'd like these responses from everyone within the next 60 seconds. Set a timer. Keep track of who's responded to take attendance. Um, and a great way to uh, increase engagement is to respond verbally as those answers come in, um, maybe with your own opinions. I, for example, am always in favor of chocolate, maybe not so much pistachio. Um, another one, emojis and reactions. We've actually been doing this ourselves in this chat today, um, which is having emojis on the chat. This is one of my favorite features of Teams. 
Um, in Zoom, we also have emoji reactions as well, though you can't do it in the chat, which is annoying to me. Um, but you can actually use these in your teaching in ways to get people engaged in quite um, chill ways from a student perspective. So as you can see in some of the chat so far, it shows you not just the emoji, but also how many people have selected that. So you can actually use it as a straw poll. You might put, I usually put um, something quite controversial in the chat and then have people vote. So for example, saying, if you agree, use a thumbs up. If you disagree, use a sad face. You have 60 seconds to respond, go. Um, this enables me to understand if people get something or if I need to spend more time on it or move on. Um, and it's great low effort participation. I can see numbers wise, even if I've got 130 students in my class, oh look, we've got 110 responses. Okay, that's probably a good sign that people are paying attention. Tips, specify how to use it. So use this for this, use this for this, and give time to respond. The student feedback of these um, types of use of the chat in live sessions, 89% of student participants really like the icebreakers, even though it's one at the beginning and the end every week, they're still not sick of them. They actually really like them. 91 of the students that I surveyed um, were in favor of answering straw poll and longer questions via the chat. Even students who liked raising their hands and using the microphone later on really liked having the chat as an option. Um, and something interesting that I found, which was definitely not true when we taught in person, was that by using the chat, um, we actually had a relatively equal number of responses across nationality, gender, disability, and time zones. So in person, those things, especially along gender and nationality lines, were not always as equal. But through the chat, they actually were much more even than using the microphone and camera. So oh, hopefully this left, is of interest. Miranda. Hopefully this is of interest and helpful. And there is more information if you're interested. Thank you. Bang on time. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have a question for Miranda? If so, would you be able to raise your hand, please? We have Laura Bailey there. Oh, I can already unmute myself. Um, yeah, I put mine in the chat, but I thought um, might as well just ask it with my voice. Um, so I saw someone talking about those kind of trivial sort of ice cream type icebreaker questions and um, saying that they would never use them at uni level because they're so infantilizing and it's like just really patronizing. And I really disagreed, actually. I love though I asked them similar questions for getting them into groups. Um, but I just wondered if you've had that feedback from anybody. Yeah, um, so that's actually a great point. I really don't like icebreakers. Um, I've been anti icebreakers as long as I can possibly remember. I think they're really annoying. Um, on the other hand, I found it to be the single best way to get students to participate immediately, um, more than literally anything else, more than asking them about content, more than asking them, how are you doing today? Um, I actually am not a pro icebreaker person in general. And yet, through testing a bunch of other things, I have found it incredibly, incredibly useful. One thing I will say is that I'm very careful about which questions I ask. Um, so I have a long list of questions. Um, I do not think that all icebreakers are equally good. Um, I think there are often actually quite a lot of issues um, with kind of standard icebreakers you can find on Google. So I am very deliberate and careful about which ones I choose um, and which ones I use when. So if I already know the group versus it's their first session, um, what is their kind of general age range and that sort of thing. Um, so I wouldn't say that you can just, you know, any icebreaker is good. Um, but yeah, I'm actually not a pro icebreaker person and yet it is the thing that has worked the best. So I guess the evidence has persuaded me. <laughs> 